If you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and open it to Ezekiel chapter 25. Um, if you've been following along with what I've preached, I've preached through chapter 15. And so it may seem like jumping to 25 would just be—I'm just following Manohar last week, jumping to the passage he was supposed to go to. But the next passage, um, chapter 16, is a very difficult passage to preach. Um, it's the most second or most offensive passage, maybe third, depending on the Ezekiel's wife dying passage. Um, in the whole book, it's very contentious. Uh, it has a lot of uh, sexual content, and uh, I just felt like I needed more reflection than a week fishing with my son to prepare for that um, that one. And we're just about to jump into the fall series next week, so um, that'll be that'll be a great a great sermon for October. Um, but I wanted a little bit more time to, to prep on that, so we're gonna jump to this one because I think that this is timely for right now kind of for the last decade, but like, it's, it's, this is in, as long as there have been humans. So um, I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read it relatively fast because I want to mainly focus on just a few phrases in this chapter. And then I'm going to read a little bit out of chapter 35. And I just want to reiterate for those of you who are spoiled that preaching is not a show. I'm not here to entertain you. Um, if you don't like how I'm doing stuff, that's really not important. The important thing is, is that I'm going to preach as best I can to re-speak the message of the scriptures themselves in the name of Christ through the message of the gospel, his death and resurrection for you in real time, hopefully in somewhat in the power of the Holy Spirit, mediated through my very imperfect personality so that you can hear from the Lord and apply something to your actual life because we are all way over-educated spiritually and way under-obedient spiritually. Do you understand? This is not an exercise in entertainment or even really in education. It's supposed to be an experiment in seeking to hear the word of the Lord from his written word, mediated through a preacher, so that we can believe and obey and learn to love. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to them, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was desecrated and over the land of Israel when it was laid waste and over the people of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, I'm going to give you to the peoples of the east as a possession. They will set up their camps and pitch their tents among you and they will eat your fruit and drink your milk and I will turn Rabbah into a pasture for camels and Ammon into a resting place for sheep. And then you will know that I am the Lord. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, because you clapped your hands and stamped your feet, rejoicing with all the malice of your heart against the land of Israel. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and give you as plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from the nations and exterminate you from the countries. I will destroy you and you will know that I am the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says, because Moab and Seir said, look at the house of Judah has become like all the other nations. Therefore, I will expose the flank of Moab, beginning in its frontier towns, Beth Jeshimoth, Baal Meon, and Kiriathim, the glory of that land. And I will not, it will not be remembered among the nations, and I will inflict punishment on Moab. And then they will know that I am the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, because Edom took revenge on the house of Judah and became very guilty by doing so. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and kill its men and animals. I will lay it waste. And from Teman to Dedan, they will fall by the sword. And I will take vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they will deal with Edom in accordance with my anger and my wrath. And they will know my vengeance, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because the Philistines acted in vengeance and took revenge with malice in their hearts and with an ancient hostility sought to destroy Judah. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I'm about to stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Kirathites and destroy those remaining along the coast. I will carry out great vengeance on them and punish them in my wrath. They will know that I am the Lord when I take vengeance on them. In Ezekiel 35 in verse 5, he's again prophesying against Moab and Seir. And he says this, I want, I want you to notice this phrase again. Because you harbored an ancient hostility and delivered the Israelites over to the sword at the time of their calamity, the time of their punishment reached 
its climax. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will give you over to bloodshed and will pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. Um, there is a fleshly endorphin hit of pleasure to taste of the downfall of others. Especially if they're smug and special, and especially if they're from a group of people that we know tend to deserve what they get because of what they believe in the culture that they perpetuate among themselves. Are you thinking of anybody in particular yet? I mean, the application of this is broad and narrow. I mean, as I sat and reflected on this, I could think back to not getting picked to be Joseph and made a shepherd for the 17th year in a row, like in, when I went to Roman Catholic Church growing up. I can think of my seminary class and how my professors didn't think I would, like, be a good pastor, and most of the people they fawned over because they were skilled and gifted or have, were in ministry for less than two years and aren't in ministry to this day. I think of uh, the pastor in my college town that didn't see any— thing in me, and pushed me away from him, even though I volunteered, and I just, and to see his church dwindle over the years, and him fall out of ministry, and I just, like, there's the, the, that wicked part of me that just, like, that tastes so good, you know? Lady Folly in Proverbs says about such things, she says, let all who are simple come in here, to those who lack judgment, stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious, but little, little do they know the dead are there and the guests are in the depth of the, of the grave. There is a um, part of the nature of the human condition as revealed in all the scriptures is that we, um, we have the capacity to eat delight in infernal things. They are, there are passions in us that feel intensely pleasurable, that they deliver certitude to our minds and hearts. They give us what we want in life, they make us feel good. They make us feel secure. They make us feel certain. They put away fear for a moment. They make us feel superior. They make us feel strong. They make us feel good. And they have a, they have a lather to them. They, it, they have a sweetness to the worst part of our souls that is addictive, and it is, and we crave it. Like stuff that we know is bad for us, but we want another one. And um, because of this, one of God's strongest messages in all of the scriptures is that he will not deliver, save, and redeem those who decidedly choose to taste and delight in and devour the condemnation of other people. God— in many passages, in many ways, in many contexts, in many, through many dynamics and many different illustrations and examples and stories, demonstrates that he condemns human condemnation of other human beings. And of course himself. <laughs> but especially human beings. Condemning other human beings. We love to do it. We delight in doing it. It makes us feel so good. And he condemns it, and it bears the greatest threat— in all of Scripture, that if we condemn others, he will judge us the way we judge others. Right? Now, that is not to say that God condemns human judgment. That is discernment or understanding, right? One of the, I, I have to keep coming back to this because some, it's very confusing to people sometimes. Condemnation can be defined this way. Determining the permanent moral status of someone— and their deserved penalties. Condemnation is, is to say, that person is blank, moral judgment, and therefore they deserve blank. And obviously if it's condemnation, it's in the negative, right? Judgment or discernment is determining the moral status of something and what it is that amounts to good and evil and how we should respond and react. So it is judgment to say, you shouldn't commit adultery. <laughs> so, Fred, you shouldn't have committed adultery. That's judgment, and that is fine. But condemnation, that you are now permanently that thing, 
irredeemable. What you've done is unforgivable. There's no way back for you in human community or in divine acceptance. You're, you're over. You might as well continue to defile yourself in whatever way you can put your hands to until you come to ultimate, complete condemnation because you are lost. Right? The, one of the themes of God again and again is there really is no place where someone goes to where they are by definition lost until his final condemnatory judgment. Now, there may be a place where we become psychologically, practically lost, so hardened in our hearts that we don't want to hear anything about God, we don't want to hear anything that could lead us to repentance, we don't want anything to do with that, and we are on that path to destruction, and we are self-condemned conscientiously. But structurally speaking, God says over and over again, there is always a way back to salvation. Always a way back. Everyone has a way back. If you breathe and live, there's a way back for you. With God, among God's people, and ultimately in the final, fully delightful, utterly righteous resting place and place of delight of God's people and himself forever, where he will be his, their people and they will be his people and he will be their God. Right? And Christians must engage in judgment thus defined and must not indulge in condemnation so defined. And when the word judgment in the Bible means in the context condemnation, you will find it being roundly condemnatory. And when judgment in the Bible in its context means discerning the moral value of a thing, you will find it usually as a positive statement. And all you got to do is read the context and want to know the truth. Now, you might ask yourself just the question, like, how absolute is God about this? Right? And this is a really interesting passage because God condemns human condemnation even when he is the condemner of the humans that are the object of the condemnation. You understand that? Do you, do you, like, do you see how extreme this is? He destroys Judah. God does it. He says in Ezekiel 14, right, that I'm going to send you a few people in exile who aren't going to be killed, and you're going to know by when you meet them how terrible a set of human beings they are. You will realize that when I destroyed Judah, I did nothing without cause. They deserved everything that they got. I was lenient in what I did in utterly destroying them, right? And then when the, the, these surrounding countries, Moab and Seir and Amnon, Philistia, all these countries around us will go, ha, 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 ha. He goes, no. You don't get to do that. You don't get to revel in it. You don't get to go, aha, or isn't that great? Or like I'll, like, I'll be part of it. God condemns human judgment even when the judgment and downfall of the people that's so tasty is God's direct judgment that he's doing themselves and they utterly deserve. You would think that if at any moment— it would be like a good thing to condemn other human beings. It would be at the moment where God was condemning them because you would know God is on the side of the condemnation, and two, it is utterly righteous that they would be condemned. Like, this is like the perfect moment. You're like, you would think God is like the cowboy with the white hat who just shot all the bad guys, and he's like, what do you think? And we're all supposed to go, yeah! I mean, it feels like a movie where like the guy with the white hat, he like shoots like nine criminals, he swings, he puts his guns away, he's like, and they all deserved it. They were like, you know, stealing horses and killing children and all this stuff, right? And, and he goes, what are you guys thinking? All the people are like, we love it! You're awesome, those suckers! And then the cowboy goes, stop! They're human beings I just killed. They had mothers, and they could have gone another way, and every single one of their lives is a tragedy, an unmitigated tragedy. And don't you dare celebrate at a time like this. That's a weird movie, right? That would be a weird movie. Be kind of a fun scene, you know? Now, this, um, this is rooted in a, a message of God all through the scriptures, which is what you might call the forgiveness condition. That is, in all of scripture, there's only two conditions for salvation. One is to believe God. To believe, to believe in God and what he says about what we must put our faith in. That is, in, in the New Testament demonstrated to be the death and resurrection of his Christ, that is Jesus. We have to put our faith in Jesus and repent of our sins and believe in him, right? The only other condition is that we not be utter and horrific hypocrites in the simple act of faith, that is, to deny to others what God gives us himself. That's it. God gives us mercy, 
and we can receive it. That's the fundamental act of salvation. We repent, we are wrong, we receive mercy, we are forgiven, right? And here's the thing. The only other condition is this. You cannot deny that dynamic to others. Mercy must triumph over judgment. And if you do, then you reject the dynamic by which God saves you, and he judges you the way you've judged. Those are the only options. Either you get judged the way God judges, or you get judged the way you judge. And listen, listen to me, you guys. I know you would think the answer is B there. (laughs) Right? Like, I know we would think that. Be like, you know what? I think I would like to be judged the way I judge people. No, you do not. We have no conception of the depth of our hypocrisy and the leniency we give ourselves and the delusional nature of how good we think we are and how terrible we think everybody else is. You know? And you can see this all through the scriptures. Matthew 6 is a good example of this. This is Jesus speaking. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts or our sins, or our trespasses, as we forgive those, forgive our debtors. Notice, as we. You see, it's the only statement in here where he doesn't just ask God for something. He asks the Father for something in relationship to something we do. Right? And then he says this. There's only one thing he comments on in the Lord's Prayer to make sure we get it. Everything else, we can sort it out in commentaries or whatever, right? But like, he's like, at least I have temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All that could be commented on, he comments on one thing. He says this, listen. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Same thing in Matthew 7. This is one of the most famous passages in the Bible, famous for being misinterpreted, where Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. That's usually as far as people get with it. Now, the the word used there, krima, in in Greek, can be used generically for judge, but the vast majority of cases in which it's used, it means a verdict, and mostly specifically condemnation, sentence, or punishment, which is condemnation, right? The context of 7-1 and how Jesus is using it is in relationship to condemnation. That is final judgment or the verdict of what's going to happen to you. Not a statement about— So if I say to you, hey, listen, I saw the way you talked to Sarah. That was like, you came in real hot, that was not cool, right? And you're like, Matthew 7, 1, don't judge lest you be judged, right? That is complete misapplication of that verse, right? That's ridiculous. That's not what that verse means. That ver- if I said, listen, I saw you talk to Sarah, you're going to hell. There's no way back for you. You're disgusting. You're worthless. You're an enemy of God. He hates your guts. And you might as well just go out and get in front of the first car you can find, or hell's going to be even worse for you. That's what that verse is about. Then you, then you should be like, Nick, uh, 7-1, you want to get judged like this? You want to—is you wanna, that how you want to go with God when he judges you? And the answer is no, right? No. And so that would be the right use of this verse. Does that make sense? And so when Jesus says this, what's the, what's the logic here? The logic here is this. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Now, see, some people have taken that to say that Christianity is not an exclusivist religion, that you don't have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven or to be saved or to be one with God, because if God promises that we'll be judged the way we judge others, and if we're open, pluralistic, open-minded, tolerant people, and we don't judge others, then God won't judge us, and we'll be saved by the fact that we weren't judgmental. You, so Christianity offers two ways of salvation at least, one through Jesus and the other through non-judgmentalism, right? <laughs> have you met yourself? Like, I don't know about you, but like, I've lived in Madison for 10 years. I lived in the, like, Red Republican South for seven. This place is way more judgmental. (laughs) Like, unbelievably more judgmental. The most judgmental people I've ever met are the most tolerant people. And I I think I understand why that is, right? Because, like, if you know you might be doing something wrong, like being judgy, you get, like, real careful about it, right? So if you're kind of like, look, God tells us we're supposed to discern the good and the bad, but we're not supposed to condemn people, and so we're supposed to judge the good and the bad. We're supposed to even confront our brothers and sisters, but we can't be condemnatory. Like, you're caught in this tension you're managing, and you're trying to do it right, and so you get really careful about it, right? If you're just kind of like, no, look, we just don't judge. Just don't do it. Boop, boop. We're done. Like, you stop being careful, and you're just like, you don't even notice when you're like, oh, that scumbag, he's too judgy. You're like, you just judge that guy. <laughs> but, like, it doesn't register because— you're not managing attention, you think you've solved the problem. 
that make sense? It's not like they're like people like that are worse people. It's just, it's the psychology of it that just lets our, we let our guard down. You know what I mean? And we all have to be careful about this. What the Bible teaches is that it doesn't matter your politics, doesn't matter if you think you're tolerant or intolerant or whatever you think you are. Everyone thinks they're moderate, right? Um, if you got to sit in an objective chair and observe your psychology, what you would observe is a really, really judgy person. Really judgy about yourself, who's made in God's image, who God loves. Like, there's, there's a song by Andrew Peterson, a guy I love, and he wrote this song for his, his junior high daughter about loving your enemies, and that needs to start with you. Because <laughs> you hate yourself so much when you're like a 12-year-old girl, you know what I mean? He's like, you gotta, gotta give yourself a break and love your enemy. Maybe that, maybe that starts with you, you know? And, but then like everybody else too, your parents and your siblings and your neighbors and your coworkers and your fellow students and your teachers and you, you don't want to be judged. The reason why God says we'll be judged the way we judge is so that the, when, the, when the sort of village irreligious person objection comes up, well, like who is God to judge me? You know, like, the answer is, well, he's the creator of the universe. He made you. He created your DNA. Like, there's lots of reasons. You belong to him in every single way. But more than that, it's like, listen, here's what God has said. God has said that nothing is needed personal in our condemnation other than the standards we have used to apply to others to apply to ourselves, both in condemnation and duration. Meaning, not only would we condemn others and justify ourselves when we're just as bad, but we would send them to hell forever— and never ourselves. Because we are way more vicious than we think. This is a warning. There's no hope in the idea that we'll be judged the way we've judged. There's no hope in that. It's only supposed to sober us to realize that the last thing we would ever want, if we have any idea of what we are in any kind of spiritual moral awakening, is the last thing we would ever want is to be judged the way we judge others. And so we would throw ourselves on mercy. Okay, I'm going to run out of sermon. I'm not going to get to Ezekiel. This is also true in James and Colossians. And okay, so there's, in, in these passages, there's three versions of vengeful malice that comes from harbored hostilities that, that are like, the reason I'm going to share these, they're signs. Like if you see them coming out of you, that means that condemnatory spirit that God condemns is in you, and you need to turn to God for repentance and turn to God afresh for his mercy and ask him to make you a person who receives mercy and lives by mercy, who's capable of discerning morally and making judgments rightly for how wisdom should function prudently, and yet simultaneously while being a morally serious person, being a giver and receiver of mercy in our relationship of love with others. And those existing in a vital tension of the, in relationship to the personality of Christ himself. And we have to learn to feel it and improv it and walk in it. Okay, so the first one is vengeful malice rejoices at the downfall of others, right? That was the first passage. He says, um, here's the thing, you guys. When, when Israel got destroyed, when Judah fell, you went, aha! <laughs> he says a couple of verses later, they clapped their hands, they stomped their feet with happiness that Israel and, and Judah fell. They were so glad, Right? And um, it's so fast how this can pop up in the human heart. Like somebody doesn't wear a mask because they think they're stupid and they get COVID and you're like a mask wearing, like socially responsible person. You're like, ha, 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 right? Or if you're a Republican and you think Joe Biden is a big dumb idiot and he pulls the troops out of Afghanistan and that country falls apart. And you're like, finally, right? The, the president is shown to be incompetent in foreign policy. I mean, it's, I was actually, I was listening to, Jim, Jim Mattis' um, book, Driving 10 Hours to Northern Wisconsin, he talked about that President Biden was in charge of pulling the troops out of Iraq, too, when the whole country fell apart and ISIS created this thousand mile— cl like, you thought he would have learned something, you know? And he does it again, and you're like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you, right? And like, you were like, finally, people are going to see. Like, no! This is a human catastrophe for millions and millions of people. A whole generation of women are going back to the dark ages. People are going to have their heads cut off and their throats slit. And it's not just like white Westerners. It's going to be Afghani people who were free for almost 20 years. And we just went, whatever, let's save $200 million a year and spend billions on ourselves on crap we don't need. Like it's, it's mind-blowing, the human catastrophe. And you're like, 
And I hear Republicans being like, finally, people are going to go, Biden's a big dumb idiot. Like, when did we have a president that wasn't? Like, that's not the point. The point is that these people are suffering a catastrophe. Right? And it's like, what are you laughing at? Why are you so happy about this? Like, I wish President Biden would be the greatest international humanitarian success in the history of the world, and that there would be a thousand Democratic presidents after him. If that wouldn't happen, and that, like, people's lives would be helped. I'm not going to be so partisan about whoever I like or don't like. Does that make sense? I'm not talking about me. That's hypothetical. Right? Like, I, I mean it. Like, I, like you, sometimes you have to personify stuff to, like, push it, right? Okay, so— God says and he's in Ezekiel itself and in other places, he's like, listen, I do not enjoy this. I don't enjoy this. Like this whole like pushing people and rebuking them and trying to stop them and trying to win them back and trying to show them the truth and trying to use all this creativity to try to like get them to turn around and then ultimately to act in disciplining ways that are incredibly painful, including horrific, terrible condemnation that destroys societies and families and people's lives. Like, I don't like this. I don't like having to condemn people's or societies. I don't like bringing havoc that comes from the foolishness and sin that people live in. I don't like any of this. So don't be happy when it happens to people. It's terrible. Right? He says it in, in Ezekiel 33. He say, same thing. Say to them. He says, it says to Ezekiel, say to the people, to these people, tell them, as I live, declares the Lord. So this is as, as true as that God is alive, right? He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For Why will you die, O house of Israel? Right. There's a lot of like ahas that you can fall into. Like there's the ahas of personal self-destruction with people you don't like, who like hurt you in certain ways. That thing through which they hurt you, ultimately it's their downfall and you see them fall and it's like, ah. Or the, um, the consequences for bad decisions. Um, like the judgment, judgment on single moms. You know what I mean? When people are like, you should have, you should not done that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? Um, don't aha right? Like, the goal is to help people and to show mercy and to make the best of every situation. Whether, like, there's, there's stuff that happens to all of us that people are going to gloat over, even if it wasn't, like, your fault. Half the times, it's not even what you think happened, right? Or political disenfranchisement, like, I already, or racial come up. It's like, I, <clears throat> I get so frustrated seeing people of all ethnicities, black and white especially, with this, like, attitude of racial come up, it's like, oh, that, that's so tasty. That white woman got that blah, 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 blah. Or it's so tasty that, like, these, like, these black people complained about this, and, like, it, 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 it like, blew up in their face. <laughs> like, the Lord hates that stuff. He hates it. He condemns human condemnation in its ahaness and liking the downfall of others, right? Second is, is that vengeful malice is glad for the special to be shown to be typical. I love that. People who like set themselves up as like the good guys or the special people or the people who like the rich or the like whatever, who, like the, the people who think they're better than us. You know what I'm talking about? It's so great to see them fall. You know what I mean? Th- to see they're just typical, especially, especially spiritual leaders who think they're morally better than us, right? It's so, it feels so good. It feels so good. To find out that that, like, pastor who was telling you how to live was, like, getting prostitutes on the side. So tasty. Right? That apologist who explained how godliness worked was, like, sexually assaulting his, like, massage people in Thailand, in Atlanta. So tasty. The guy who talks about, like, like, giving for the Lord, right? Who has, like, two planes and a Bentley. And, like, it all gets blown up publicly. It feels so good. And, um, you can see this, right? Like, the reason he condemns Moab and Seir, which is like this kind of the southeast, he said, it's because of this. Because you said, look, the house of Judah has become like all the other nations. You get it? They knew that the Jewish people thought that they were the elect. God's special people. They built that temple. They like 
did all that stuff. They had all their cool—they didn't just have little temple, little shrines out in the hills. They, like, they had their big thing, and they were, they were all that. And they were like, a light to the nations, and had the Word of God written, and blah, 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 blah. And look at them. Look at them now! Walking single file through the desert, being dragged off 700 miles to live somewhere else. Aren't they special? God must love them a lot. Right? And God's like, yeah, it's so disgusting. You have no idea. Especially to wish against moral triumph and spirit's triumph. To bet against it. To want people trying to be good to fail. Do you see how perverse that is? Do you feel how perverse that is? To want that spiritual person to not experience what they say they're experiencing. To not want them to be close to God. To, to find out that they were a fraud. To find out that that person that was like, like married for 40 years had like two in us. Like, like you want that? You want to know the world is that wicked. You want to know that doing what's beautifully good is impossible. You want to know that people really can't be good so that what? So that you and I can just wallow in whatever comes natural to us? Right? God's like, that is so disgusting. But that's what vindictive malice feels. The condemnatory human spirit says, isn't that just perfect, right? Different cultures have their, have their versions of this. Like, um, Devin was talking about tall poppy syndrome in Australia. You cut that thing off. Anybody who thinks that they're better, like it's just, right? Or like in um, some, some places in East Africa, they talk about hammering down the tallest nail. Whichever nail sticks up, you hammer it down. Nobody should stick up above everybody else. Even like the idea of like loving a scandal, like Netflix just came out with a documentary, Bob Ross, happy accidents, betrayal, and greed. And the assumption is, what you're supposed to assume is, is that like the happy Buddhist like painter guy who painted happy trees is like a betraying, greedy scumbag. And you're like, oh, I'm going to watch that. You know, it's like, turns out it's like his business partners and he was like a nice guy that got taken advantage of and blah, 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 blah. Right? But the point is, you know, like, white afros aside, that like the whole—why is it titled that? Why is it titled that? It's titled that because we love—there's a part of us that would love to find out that Bob Ross was a betraying, greedy little turd. I wanted to put the fish in front of that, but I'm I'm just not supposed to say that word, you know? Um, And you—listen, as Christians, we have to learn to recognize the flesh— for what it is. You have to believe in the differentiation between the, between the Spirit of God, between the image of God, between your true humanity, and that which is bent and broken in that humanity that Scripture calls the flesh, the part that just wants to taste everything infernal and rejoice in it. And you got to know which part of you is working, and when that part of you is working, what the Bible says is you're supposed to crucify it, strangle it, kill it. It has to die. You give it no quarter, no space, no time. Right? Whether it's, whether it's self-justifying anger, whether it is the experimentation of the mind of lust with someone, whether it is rejoicing in the downfall of others, it gets no quarter, no time, no space. Right? The third thing is vengeful malice or harbors ancient hostility. What the New Testament calls the, um, the root of bitterness. And th- this will be a little touchy, but um, it says in Ezekiel 25, because the Philistines acted in vengeance and took revenge with malice in their hearts and with ancient hostility, they sought to destroy Judah. And he says later in, um, in Ezekiel 35 that because of that, the harboring of that ancient hostility and the malice that it created, it made them the kind of people that didn't hate bloodshed. It, it, it like— it stultified and it depressed and hardened that, w- that human decency which only the conscience can create in compassion for other people and not wanting vicious harm to come to them. When we give ourselves to the concatenations of the flesh, just like bouncing around being like, oh, I like that. Oh, that's good. That person stinks. What happens is it, it's destroying this God-given part of you, the spirit-empowered part of your conscience and your a capacity for compassion, and what Galatians call it. Remember, like, read Galatians 5, right? Like, it says, the works of the flesh are obvious, and there's a whole list of them. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the Spirit nurtures those things, and the flesh nurtures those other things, and they don't coexist well. It's not like you can nurture the works of the flesh, and they're obvious, and then you can nurture the works of the Spirit, and they just, they'll just coexist. They don't. They are 
they're at loggerheads with each other. They're fighting against each other. That's why he concludes by saying, let's not be drunk on wine, but let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's not feed what will feed the flesh, but let's be filled with what will empower the work of the Spirit that is, which is good and redemptive. Right? There's this passage in Matthew where Jesus is teaching, and he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, it's an interesting quote (laughs) because only the first part of it's in the Bible. (laughs) So Leviticus 19, 18 does say to love your enemy, but the the, the clause right after that in the Bible is not, um, and hate your enemy. Love your neighbor is not, and hate your enemy. That was added as a proverb in Israel. So people just said it like it was in the Bible. There are, ver- there are things like that that we probably say too. I mean, we don't really quote the Bible anymore in our culture, but people used to say like, cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like, you just kind of say it. Sounds good, right? Second Nick 417 sort of deal, right? And, and so people would just say this. They just say, you know, uh, you know, the Bible says, the good book says, um, you know, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus is like, you know what? It doesn't say that. <laughs> it says love your neighbor, but it turns out what you're supposed to understand is that your enemy is a kind of neighbor. And so he says, but I tell you that— it, and he, he's not saying I'm changing the Bible. That's not what he's really doing. He's saying, let me just tell you what this really means. Because you've heard people say stuff that's wrong. But I'm telling you, love your enemies— and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, he's merciful, right? They're still, these, these are people not, these are not people who were wicked, who've turned around. And now because of their, their good prospects, God's like, you know what? This guy's going to turn out to be something. I think I'm going to hang with him, right? No, they're still wicked. He's like, you know what? They need some sun and rain, right? He's merciful while they're wicked, right? And he's like, if you want to be the sons and daughters of God, you have to behave like that. You don't just love people if they'll turn around. You don't just love people if they'll be better. You love people as the wicked and as your enemy. You love them. And he says, listen, if you don't do that, then you're not any different because you belong to Jesus. I mean, everybody likes people who like them. I mean, that's, you can do that in the flesh. You can be completely consumed with sin, utterly depraved, the the hardest heart in the world, and you're going to like people who like you. He's like, the difference of regeneration, the real work of the Spirit and the human heart that can happen through actual faith in the God who lives, is that you can love your enemies. You can forgive them. You can be gracious to them. Right? I want to be clear what what this means, because there have been churches that have said, you know, because we should forgive our enemies— and because the Bible says in another place, Jesus says, listen, if somebody sins against you seven times in one day, comes back seven times and says, I repent, you should forgive them, right? <clears throat> that doesn't mean— see, some people have thought that means, like, if somebody, like, abuses a girl in the children's ministry, we should bring them into the office and be like, listen, this girl reported that you did this thing. Is that true? And, and the guy's like, yeah, it's true, but I'm really sorry. I repent. I ask God for forgiveness. And we go, well, okay. Like, I mean, honestly, God, that's how some people interpret that verse. They think it means that. They think, well, then we forgive him. And if we forgive him, then we restore him. If we restore him, then we let him do whatever he needs to do. It's just like, otherwise we're not forgiving him, and then we're condemning ourselves, and then we're all going to go to hell, right? That's not really what it means. What it means is, is that <clears throat> if you do that, you're not engaging in the judgment that is the discernment of what's good and evil and what ought to be done prudently that, that Christians have to do. You're supposed to do that. Right? You can, you can hug a guy and forgive him and then call the police. You do that. And I just want you to know, if you hurt somebody in this church in some kind of way like that, and you confess to me, I will, I will pray Christ's forgiveness over you if you're repentant, and I will hug you and love you, and I will call the police and have you taken away so that you can um, serve time and you can um, face justice. Right? That's what's going to happen. And <clears throat> that's what you should do if that happens. If I do that, same thing. If I repent, you should embrace and forgive me, and you should call the police and have them take me away. You understand? And love me while I go through my trial and go to prison, and my family falls apart, and all of that, so that I could be ultimately restored in whatever good can be made of the carnage I would have made of my life. Right? And you would never let me serve in the children's ministry ever, ever again. And I would always be chaperoned at the church whenever I came, 
with another man that was willing to like stop me from whatever I would try to do if I wasn't abiding, abiding by what I said I would do, right? You, it doesn't mean, forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't have discernment and you don't act prudently, right? What it means is, is that you don't act and uh, th- do actions that proceed from harboring malice and revenge, right? You don't decide what to do to that guy based on how angry you are because of what they did and how much you want to condemn and kill them. That's not the measuring stick, right? Once you put that aside in forgiveness, all the other commands of God in terms of prudence and action and wisdom and righteousness and protection all come into play and are just as valid as they were. We just don't do it out of human condemnation. Does that make sense? When Jesus says that we're to forgive one another, he doesn't take away our responsibility to the civil authorities. He doesn't take our, away our responsibility even to make restitution. Like if, I, like, if I wreck somebody's car and by, like, being stupid, and they're like, Nick, I forgive you. Like, it's okay. I'm still going to try to save the money to buy them a new car. I'm still going to do that. I still, I still, if I'm repentant, I would want to make whoever I've cut as whole as I can be, as whole as I can. And so I'll do that even if they forgive the debt. And if I hand them the keys and they just go, look, I don't want it, then I'm not going to force them, but I'm going to do my best to restore the relationship, to do everything I can. Does that make sense? Now, so lastly, let me just say this. Um, The only way to really feel what Isaiah 40 calls being raised up on eagle's wings in God, is to experience feeling like you weigh 10,000 pounds under the weight of sin. Moral gravity precedes spiritual uplift. That's how it works. Because God doesn't want flighty creatures that don't care about anything, that don't have any moral gravity. Because we'll never be like him. But he wants free creatures that can live by love and give and receive mercy. And the only way to do that is for us to be so morally grounded— in what we understand to be our our rightful self-condemnation as to reach out to his mercy. And when we see things like rejoicing at the falling of others, or being glad to see good people, trying to be good, like to see them fall, or to harbor hostilities of the past in our hearts, when we see those, we know we are operating in condemnation. We know it. And God cares so much about you being free of all that, that he has endangered your soul over it. He has said, if you won't forgive others, he won't forgive you. And the reason he's done that is so that you can actually be his child, so that you can actually face the moral horror of what it takes to forgive and really be free and become a person who can live by mercy and therefore love. It's the only way. It it can't be developmentally sidestepped. The greatest irony about all of this— is you can see this message again in the crucifixion of Jesus himself. Let me think about this for a second. Who was Jesus dying for, right? Jesus claimed that he was a substitute, right? So who was he substituting for? He claimed that he was a substitute for humanity, right? So when people jeered and condemned him on the cross, who were they jeering? Whose sins were they jeering? Who were they condemning, right? They were condemning themselves. And that's what we do when we condemn others, right? When we condemn others, we might as well be looking in the mirror and condemning ourselves. When we fling condemnation around, even when it was flung at Jesus himself, dying in our place, when people like us jeered him, the irony of it was they were declaring and calling for their own condemnation. And that's what we do when we choose to not just make right judgments and pursue merciful restoration and living in prudent wisdom for the glory of God. But when we condemn other human beings for whatever reason we think is justifiable, we call for our own. We jeer for our own condemnation. And Jesus' response to to our, our hearts when we're like that is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? It's, it's in a way the worst sin possible in a way. And, God, and Jesus is pursuing us to show mercy so that we would turn around and we would figure out 
that there's, there's only one way of life, and that is to forgive, to condemn human condemnation as God does, to realize that even if God himself is condemning someone, our job is not to share in it, but to care for, love, and show mercy even to the person God is condemning. There's no one in the Bible who shows mercy to someone God condemns and is condemned for it. But there are numerous people in Scripture who heap on the condemnation God brings and are destroyed. It's fine to believe in moral seriousness. We want to be people who are pursuing the good. We should be pursuing holiness and godliness in everything that we do. But if pursuing the right makes us legalistic enough to condemn our brothers and sisters around us, we have lost everything. And we have lost the very spirit of the Christ we claim to believe in. And the very spirit of the main ritual that he has put at the center of the church, which we call communion. Does that make sense? So, I'm going to pray. And um, we're going to pass it out. Let me say this. When you take this little cup and you drink and you eat the piece of bread, you are proclaiming that Christ died for your sins that you were self-condemned, that he forgave you, and that you will and must forgive others. First in the church, the body of Christ, and then to even love and forgive our enemies. And I want you to know that that freedom is possible. If you go back to that passage in James, you know what he says? He says, listen, if you're a Christian, you need to learn to live like the kind of person— listen to this right now. This is—I think that these next two sentences could change your life. He said, you need to live like the kind of person who's going to be judged by the law that brings freedom. Therefore, show mercy. Because everybody who shows mercy will receive mercy, and everybody who doesn't will be condemned without it. That's the law that brings freedom. Do you understand? Forgiveness and showing mercy to others while maintaining the moral seriousness of God, being filled with the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, comes from this law that brings freedom. God, as we prepare to take, uh, take in this ritual to share in your broken body and shed blood, we pray that you would help us to believe in you, to trust in you, to honor you, to love you, and to become people of mercy, to be people who utterly reject the ahaing and the celebrating and the condemnation of others, to be people full of right judgment as in discernment and utterly free of self-condemning condemnation that harms others, destroys ourselves, and attacks your own glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Nick. Hey. Um, Welcome to the AMA portion of the service. If you have a question, you can still send it in. Um, Just text in the text, put AMA at the front of the text, and then whatever your question is, and send that to 608-836-3236. And uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. And any that we don't get through, we'll do on the podcast. So let's jump right in. So Nick, what is the right way to understand that salvation is a gift of grace, not by works, yet we are condemned if we do not forgive? In other words, how is forgiveness not a work if it's a condition for salvation? Yeah, I think the most straightforward answer to that is that um, salvation can be by grace even if you are expected to live in grace, right? So if you think about it one way, you could say this. Refusing condemnation and forgiveness is to choose grace. It's to choose mercy rather than judgment. And if you don't do that, if you refuse to do that, then the thing you called faith, where you repented of your sins and you accepted God's mercy, that's not real. The most straightforward example of that is, and I think it's Matthew 20, it's called the parable of the unmerciful servant, where there's a guy who owes like $5 million and the master like wipes out the debt, and then he goes and he chokes a coworker over 50 bucks. And like the master drags him back in and reinstates the debt and throws him in debt of prison, throws his whole family in debt of prison. And God is trying to make a point that like he will freely give us grace and mercy so we can be saved. But if you turn around and you refuse the principles of grace in your own life, you just won't be great. Then like what you call faith isn't faith. Like you haven't experienced transformation. And that's, the Bible doesn't call that a work. I think it's important to recognize this. We like to get persnickety with God and call anything a work. And the Bible does not count everything as a work. Otherwise, faith is a work. 
right? Like, yeah. so you yeah. have to follow how Scripture uses the word work in relationship to faith. And living by mercy is embodied faith in the New Testament, not a work. Yeah. Yeah, it's helpful. Um, the next question is, can you repeat the verses that you ended with and talk more about the law that brings freedom? So I guess, can you just expand on that idea? Yeah. Can and you, can um, you repeat them from memory? I don't know if memory? you guys can bring that slide up from the presentation, but um, what James says is, I think this is in chapter two. I'm trying to remember the reference off the top of my head. But he says, um, he talks about the law that brings freedom, right? And it's, it's easy to think that that's just the gospel as like, because that's what we just assume, right? But what he explicitly says is, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, what happens in Christian faith when you realize that you have to live by mercy, like you have, don't have a choice. You receive mercy, you have to live by mercy. It's really terrifying at first because you can't like claim rights for yourself that you're used to doing. You can't be assertive in ways you want to be. You can't control your life as a manager and as like some great warrior hero, right? Um, and it puts a kind of passivity in your life where you have to work improvisationally in the situations that exist, discovering what is merciful and gracious to do in each case. And, um, and sometimes that's a hard thing. It's like, it looks like a warrior's action. And other times it looks like a, a doctor. I mean, Tolkien got this right when he said that the sign that the king had returned will not be that he won the war, but that there will be healing in his hands. That's when you know it will be the true king. Um, and when you live by mercy, what you ultimately experience is freedom. Yeah. You, you just, and I, there's, I have to talk for 30 minutes about exactly why that works that way psychologically, but that is what happens if you'll trust God and do it, what it produces. And in John 7, Jesus says this, like, I to, if you want to know if the words I've said are from God, do them, and then you'll realize there are some things, especially the psychological truths in Scripture, which it's not logically or philosophically obvious why it would be true. Mm -hmm. Most of those are psychologically true. And the best way to learn the theological, psychological truths of Scripture is to do them and experience them. Because that's the best way, because it's not intuitive, but then you experience it, you're like, right. oh, that's how it works. Yeah, like I know, I know you've mentioned before, like, do it and pay attention to what's happening as you're doing it, and you'll learn why God asked for it in the first place, uh, that oftentimes things work like that. Yeah. Uh, next question is, how does God's hatred of human condemnation translate to how we should relate to each other on social media? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it translates. It, yeah. I, there's, a, there's a lot of that. I was asked by a person who's sort of, sort of like coming out of a fundamentalist background recently to comment on this lady who was saying crazy stuff, right? Basically, she, she experienced something awful. She didn't think her fundamentalist church handled it well, so she'd gone full hog wild to the other side and said that God wanted human sacrifices and stuff, taking scriptures out of context. And but when you went and looked at the comments on this thing that she said from all these people that had been in that former movement, it was all like, God's going to kill you. Like, I mean, like really kind of very me. And, and like, I just like said, you know, if you read a couple chapters past that, God explains how you redeem the firstborn by a sacrifice of a lamb and that he doesn't allow for any human sacrifices. So I, th I think you're mistaken on interpreting that passage, yeah. right? So you can use judgment and say, look, I mean, this is false what you're doing here. And, um, but like, God's work is redemption. People aren't redeemed by condemnation. <laughs> like, it's just, yeah. it's not hard. Yeah. It's just hard. It's not hard mentally. It's just hard emotionally. Like, when we condemn people, we drive them away from God. And um, people require the law of judgment. They have to be told what they're doing is wrong. But they have to feel in what you say that they're invited back in. Right? Um, and so both of those things have to coexist, right? And so the Lutherans would say it's, it's, it's law and grace. Yeah. And if the law, law and grace have the right relationship, it brings moral seriousness and grace and mercy in this beautiful union that creates true humanity in relationship to God. And if you take out law, it doesn't work. And if you take out grace, it certainly doesn't work. And you, gotta, you just got to get that right. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would just say, listen, if you can't do it, then don't comment. Don't post stuff. Don't do it. Just don't do it. If like you're typing and you like feel really like you're sh super sure, that's anger. 
Stop, like, I, lit, like, I, I did this last night. Okay, last night, I looked at the complaint from the health department about some of our people on stage not wearing masks, right? And I wrote a really good page-long email to that guy who's probably just trying to do his job, but he has to, probably has to send out this form letter to everybody. It's really condescending. And, um, and I was just like, okay, I can't, I, I'm not supposed to, I shouldn't send this. So I just like, I stored it in a thing and, you know, and because yeah. like, I, he got me hot. I was like, and, but like, it was, it wasn't, anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God, you know? Yeah. So I'm, rem- do it. I'm reminded of the SNL skit where the guy says, stop it. Just stop it yeah. over and over about her psychological yeah. problems. People, we need, I wish yeah. I had as much money as, the, you know, Dennis Rodman had the no guy that he like paid this guy a salary to be in his life and just say no. Especially if he was going to do something with a woman that would be illegal. And I like, I honestly, I, I would love to have a no person in my life that like just was more broadly godly. Some like 80 year old seasoned retired pastor with grandkids who would just be like, I'd be saying something to a staff member. He just tapped me on the shoulder be like, no. <laughs> Say it like this. So uh, that's how we should. But we have to do this ourselves. Do media, like God yeah. has made us able in the spirit. Let's do it ourselves. Yeah. Right? The spirit will be like, the spirit will say to you, right. no. And you kind of learn yeah. to listen to that. Hopefully the spirit can be the no guy for you. So right. I probably shouldn't wish for a replacement to God's spirit with me, but I, that's sometimes how I <laughs> yeah. feel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, can you share some specific ways that we can love people we don't like? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, specific ways. Okay. Um, I, I, they probably don't want to grow up. Like, it's, that's as good as stop it, right? Um, yeah, so uh, you brought, try to be—so Richard John Newhouse said this, and he was quoting somebody. The, the secret to being universally interesting is being universally interested. And so by being more creatively interested in more things than your narrow little existence and the stuff you naturally like— you become to be a nerd, but not a snob of other things, right? So you like all kinds of different things, but you're not a snob about it. Like, oh, it's got to be like this, and I can't believe they cooked it that way, you know? And so as you become like kind of a nerd of more things, you like more things, and your pleasures broaden. And then what often happens is as they broaden, this person you don't like right here, your likes broaden out enough to like there's something about them you like. And then you're like, oh, we share this thing, or I like this thing about you. There was one time, there was a guy on a softball team I was part of as a church. I, okay, I won't say anything about church softball, but he was on the team. And he was one of the most unlikable people I've ever met. I mean, top four, maybe, you know, worse than me, you know. And um, saying a lot. Yeah. And I remember one day, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to just decide I liked him. Just like as a just decision. Like, it's, I like this guy. Like, and it's amazing how, like, it really did change my attitude a lot. Because I was like, like, my position on this guy is I like him, you know. And just more and more, it was just kind of like everything, like I, I just, I did, it didn't take everything the wrong way. It wasn't cumulative that everything annoyed me on the basis of all the other things he'd annoyed me about before. I started thinking about like, why does he behave this way? Well, most of this, most of his behavior is rooted in insecurity and he, people didn't like him and people treated him like, so I just started treating him more nicely and then he was less annoying. And it, like, it's amazing how, so I think, I think this gets back to the idea that like every person you meet is made in God's divine image. They yeah. bear his properties, yeah, his communicable attributes. That is the ways we can be like God, and he, they are died for. And so they are the apple of God's eye, the person who even in the, in the throes of their wickedness, if they are, are, are an adamant unbeliever, he gives them sun and rain today. And you are only God's son or daughter if you can embrace that. And so like your desire to love God and to be who you were meant to be and to be in the life of the Spirit and to— live in the law that brings freedom and all that stuff is like rooted in like your ability to love your enemy or to love the people you really don't like, which is our euphemism for our enemies. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, I think what I heard was at least partially a plea to just, just think about Nick. I like him, you know, he could. Yeah. So, um, (laughs) yeah, I mean, yeah, this, I I wish Alexi, my wife was here to answer that. (laughs) Um, I think she actually has a book on her bookshelf. Like, if you walk in and you see where she sits to, like, do her stuff, there's a, there's a book called Being Married to a Difficult Man. <laughs> and it's, it's a compliment because it's about uh, Jonathan Edwards and Sarah <laughs> Edwards' go. marriage there. to Jonathan Edwards. So in some sense, it's kind of like a compliment, but it's also a reminder to me. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, there are a couple more questions in here that we'll get to in a future AMA in the Engage and Equip podcast. Um, also, if you're here in person, uh, there will be people who you can pray with over here, and you can go outside to the outdoor lobby after the service. And if you're online, um, you can go to, you can click the button to pray with somebody if you'd like to pray with somebody mm-hmm. about something in the service. Yeah. God, we pray that you'd help us in the things of grace to fail in the right direction to know that you are a giver of mercy to all who are repentant hearted. All who want mercy, you give mercy. Jesus once said to people who came to him that those who come to him, he would would never turn away. And so I pray that um, that as we talk about these things today, that there would actually be freedom in it, that we could be free of condemnation in our heart, free of the root of bitterness that's taking up a portion of our soul, free of that which hardens our heart, and that we could know that in releasing some of these things that we could become more full-hearted, more godly, more yours, that we could, we could hear the word and speaking of your spirit in our hearts better, that we would understand the words of Christ written, that we could follow him more beautifully, and that you would do amazing providential things in our lives if we would dare to obey you with full-hearted mercy and grace towards others and even ourselves. We pray that you'd help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.